and happy Monday. I hope you and your loved ones are doing well. Welcome to this conversation on the challenge of mass transition to remote delivery as an issue of scale. I'm Yakut Ghazi. I serve as the Associate Dean for Learning Systems at Georgia Tech Professional Education. We are the lifelong education arm and the global campus of Georgia Institute of Technology. This past year, we served over 129,000 learners through our online master's degrees, undergraduate courses, massive open online courses, and in-person uh, professional education offer offerings as well as online offerings. So today's conversation is about impact and scale. A great conversation to have at an event that focuses on learning impact under the auspices of an organization that upholds global collaboration to create standards tool, standard tools for learning to achieve impact at scale and improve affordability and access. The origin of our topic comes from the notion of horizontal versus vertical scale. Pre-COVID, several of us on this panel were from institutions that have been in the forefront of not only online, but also at scale and affordable learning. We had been the leaders of what we called vertical scale, where a limited of no number of programs and courses were built that sustain a vertical growth of en enrollments. Now, then came, came COVID-19. And responding, responding to the uh, challenges of COVID-19, um, on our campuses, we engaged in wide collaboration and coordination of not only technological capabilities, but also human talent distributed across our institutions in order to be able to quickly pivot to what we call a horizontal scale because it, it involved many students distributed over many courses taught by many faculty. And this realization of difference in scale led us to write a book on our institutional responses to this horizontal scaling of remote and online delivery of courses as a result of the pandemic. And um, I think Mark Bluba is going to put the link in the chat to our book, which is free and online, and it's available to anybody who would like to take a look at it. So what we're going to do is um, my speakers today are several authors from this book. We will touch upon some of the ideas from the book about horizontal scale specifically, but most importantly, we will have an interactive discussion on what happened since we wrote this book. Uh, it's been 12 to 15 months since we penned these chapters and how our thinking changed, how our institutions changed, what do we see in the horizon? Uh, and my panelists need no introduction, but here they are very briefly. So I will start with uh, Dr. MJ Bishop. She is the Associate Vice, Vice Chancellor and Director of the University System of Maryland's William E. Kirvin Center for Academic Innovation which is established in 2013 to create a collaborative culture of academic innovation that catalyzes new ways of thinking about student success, translates ideas into action, and scales and sustains promising practices. Informed by the diversity of the system's 12 public higher education institutions, findings from learning sciences and capabilities of emerging technologies, the center leads efforts, statewide efforts to implement, evaluate, and scale and sustain innovations aimed at student success. Very well positioned for the challenge of the pandemic. So we'll, we'll hear from Mary and Jay just in a little bit. Uh, so the, my next uh, speaker is Dr. Rovi Brennan. Um, he's the vice provost leading University of Washington's Continuum College in Seattle. Uh, UW's Continuum College serves over 55,000 learners annually through 110 professional master's degrees, 100 certificates, international English language programs, summer quarter, high school, conference services, OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, and you know, to, to, there's probably more to this since the writing of this bio. Uh, Roby's advocacy for increasing access to higher education and workforce development has been featured in several leading media outlets. I go to my third speaker, Dr. Karen Stibley, who served Brown University as an action-oriented leader, building new programs and po policy and action initiatives of key significance to the university for over 38 years. Karen served from 2014 to 19 as the inaugural dean for Brown School of Professional Studies, creating and managing a portfolio of executive master's degrees, as well as continuing to oversee an undergraduate and professional so summer uh, programs enrolling over 7,000 students. 
During her long career in higher education, Karen was involved in many institutional responsibilities, including multi-institution collaboration and degree design accreditation, organization administration, student affairs, international programs, career development, and public service engagement. And my fourth panelist, who is joining us from a construction site because she is she can be a thought leader from anywhere, anytime. And Dr. Mary Walshock is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Public Programs and the retired Dean of Extension at the University of California, San Diego. Um, she's a thought leader and subject matter expert on aligning workforce development with regional economic growth. As head of the continuing education and public programs arm of UC San Diego, she oversaw programs that educated more than 100,000 enrollees annually. Her current work focuses on enhancing public understanding of science and building human ties across class, ethnic and racial boundaries through arts, culture and civic programming. All right, so let's get this conversation started. I will go to Mary first. Um, so Mary, in your introduction chapter of our book, uh, which the link is in the chat uh, for you folks, um, you describe the metaphors shaping the who, what, and how higher education institutions can continue to be relevant and responsive in a rapidly changing world. And I think your current role has, you know, the ingredients of this you know, reshaping of higher education for the future. Can you share some of the main ideas with our audience here? And we'll take two to three minutes for this first round of questions. All right, Mary? Okay, thank you. I, I think there are two things, uh, actually three things that are important to consider as we think about our role and the role of technology. One is that the rapidity with which technology is content, uh, changing the content of all knowledge, as well as skills requirements in all jobs, whether you're a reservation clerk in a hotel or you're a rocket scientist or you're an emergency room nurse. And so technology has unleashed the need for lifelong learning among all classes and all groups of people and all categories of work. The second thing is that the global imperatives that are changing everything in terms of market forces, but also geopolitical issues like global immigration have significantly changed the character of the populations with whom we work and we serve, as has number three, our growing consciousness of a as a nation that large groups of people have been left behind with the growth of the higher education infrastructure that is based on residential campuses and full-time learning. And so there are enormous pressures for universities to change how they deliver, and I would say even some of the content that they deliver educationally. Finally, apropos of today's uh, panel, COVID surfaced that the promise many of us saw in technology as address for addressing these three issues is not fully realizable, can't be achieved unless we recognize uh, what I wrote down is four important things. One is not everyone in society has equal knowledge and competency in using technology, much less access to computers and to internet and to the tools you need. What we learned in San Diego is privacy is a huge issue. When you're doing things online, you need to have a closet, you need to have a room, you need to have a quiet place. We discovered lots of our students, lots of our employees didn't even have a quiet space from which to do their work. And as we move finally to this more and more hybrid environment where people are juggling everything virtually, you know, they're working from home, they're supporting their children from home, and they're trying to learn and advance, we need to really think about how to make technology as, as uh, adaptable to these demands and as accessible as possible. 
And so that I think is the context for today's conversation, building on the introductory context I wrote about in our book. Wonderful. Thank you for this for this brief, I mean, for, for getting us started with this great conversation. MJ, I'm going to go to you next. Um, you described the COVID-19 period as a liminal space in the book, where norms and conventional wisdom no longer operate as they once did. And we're still in that space, 18 months into the pandemic. Is it 19 months now? Yeah, <laughs> and, and <laughs> planning for a disrupted spring, right? So it doesn't yes. ever seem to end. Yeah. Yes, yes. So without ignoring the devastating social effects of the pandemic, you thought this way we can embrace this as an opportunity for transformational change, embrace this liminal space and the freedom that it brings because conventional wisdom no longer operates. Can you talk to us about how institutions can leverage the massive and su sudden move to remote teaching sparked by COVID-19 to foster a culture of academic innovation at scale? All in two to three minutes, okay, I got it. Only. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more in the book, obviously, but. Um, first of all, I couldn't agree with Mary Moore. I think simply throwing technologies into the mix has never been a solution to, to the issues that we're trying to, to face in higher education and K-12 education for years prior to this. Um, in fact, for me, when I view you know, the, the role that educational technology should be playing, in what we do, you know, leading with the tools never, never solves the problem. We need to lead with the problems we're trying to solve. And quite frankly, over the last 19 months, however long it's been, we suddenly now we're all faced with basically the same problem, right? How do we replicate in our minds what we've done uh, on campus in the online space? How do we how do we make this this shift, the pivot, as as so many of us have called it? And I guess as I look at the and think about that liminal space and have been pondering from my perspective in a center for academic innovation, what could we be doing? It's occurred to me that that hopefully. The fact that we were all rallied around that one problem, that if we could hang on to that momentum long enough to then recognize this whole thing is unearthed a whole lot of other problems that Mary just outlined. You know, normal wasn't so good for all of our students. So how do we go about taking what we've learned and moving it into the next space? And I think that, you know, in the book, in the chapter, we talk a lot about helping key stakeholders see themselves in the work, which is to help them identify the problems they're facing on their campuses and identify the ways in which these kinds of technologies and, and approaches can support the work that they need to be doing, taking it to the next level in terms of focusing on transfer, really truly transformational academic innovation models instead of simply using the tools to replicate what we've always done in the past. A good example from, in my view of that has been a lot of the work, for example, that we've done around OER, where we're largely swapping textbooks and not thinking about how openly licensed materials can change teaching and learning. Um, another thing that we talk about in the book a lot is finally getting senior leadership to help us begin to move this conversation away from it being a nice peripheral activity over here that's been going on and we've been experimenting with to mission critical and squarely focused in discussions that are happening among senior leaders and not just the provosts. We need to get our CFOs involved, our presidents involved. What is gonna be the strategy moving forward and how do we create this, You know, really make this a mission critical conversation? So I'll stop there in the interest of giving time to my colleagues. But happy to unpack yeah, I, that. More. I'm hoping I'm hoping we're going to come back and unpack this, especially the involvement of not only provosts but others in the university ecosystem, as the ecosystem outside of us uh, is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the role and what's the what's partnership looks like, and then you know there, there are a lot of roles at the university environment that have a say in that, in shaping that uh, conversation and relationships. So, Rovi, if I may, my next question is to you. You asserted in the book that the pandemic led to online delivery at a scale previously considered impossible. And I love this following sentence from the book that you had, processes long believed to be etched in stone have proven to be as changeable as those created by a word processor. And isn't that true? COVID-19 caused our, caused our concept of scale to shift again and to rethink our universities and position all those aspects of our work beyond courses and degrees with a consideration of scale. Can you tell us these aspects of scale for a university operation that go beyond courses and degrees? 
Uh, thank you, Yaku. Like my colleagues, it's it's hard to capture um, too much in two to three minutes, but uh, but I certainly hope people will go uh, take a look at the book and 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 let me remind you, as Yaku said, it's a free book, so we're not trying to push uh, something on you for the purpose of generating revenue, but hopefully generating great conversation with colleagues is is I think the goal of uh, of this book, which is now a year old and a lot has changed. Uh, in the last year for us all. Uh, yeah, and I'd love to come back uh, perhaps in our conversation about the idea of being etched in stone versus a word processor and the speed with which decisions were made uh, and whether or not we can uh, ever return to the decision-making cycles that we used to have prior to the pandemic. I think that's another worthy topic of conversation. But when we think about scaling our universities, you know, really we've known for a very long time and even prior to the 1999 book, on uh, the no significant difference phenomenon by Russell, uh, there was work showing very little difference between different media forms and instructional delivery, right? So we've known that for a long time and we uh, have seen that as it's moved forward uh, even today, we know how to scale instruction. We know how to scale vertically with our institutions. We can deliver courses to larger numbers of people than ever before. And we have quite a bit of research showing how we can do that, how we can do that effectively. But that doesn't mean our whole institution is running at scale. And, and I think that sort of thinness of the institutional reach is something we have to really be able to address. And you know, first of all, I'd say networking and connections. We know that outside of a digital classroom, there's nowhere near the same networking and connection activity that goes on in a face-to-face -face campus. We haven't developed those infrastructures. We've spent billions developing face-to-face -face infrastructures. We've spent maybe millions developing online or digital infrastructures. And we need to look at those in the same way for the same reason. It's not just about educational delivery, it's about building communities of learners over their lifetimes. I think we, we also have to look at service breadth in other areas. And some universities are doing this in places now, and it even started before the pandemic. But we know we provide students on campus with uh, wraparound services, life services, not just instructional services, but mental health care services, medical services, counseling services for what to do next in life, career services in ways that I think have not quite caught up in most places in the online world. Though in the last two years, we've seen great progress, even in the breadth of services being expanded to students who could not come to campus. And I think as Mary really started us off with, really the third reason for this is it's, a, it's an equity issue, right? And I think that what we're seeing is in the way we're describing it at the University of Washington is a, is a tension of two different elements of what we can think about with equity. On the one hand, we see what we can now do when we equitably open up the university to every learner without regards to whether they, they can attend physically on our campus. And when suddenly every course becomes available to everyone, that is a real game changer, not just a selected subset of online programs and courses designed for adult learners, but every single course at the university essentially was open and available to all learners. So, so that is one form of equity when we look at the potential to reach learners that could not come to our institutions. But as Mary was saying, as MJ was saying, the flip side to that is there's two elements that we also have to continue to examine. And one is we know that our current technologies are also a reflection of the inequitable distribution of power and decision-making in society. So we have to be mindful that our current technologies, we know that MOOCs, massive open online courses tend to educate the educated already, right? So how do we pay attention to these kinds of issues? Um, but second, and I think this is more directly what Mary was implying, these technologies can create their own inequities outside of those that may be reflected in the way that they operate today. And uh, those may result from coming from a home without digital literacy, coming from a region without digital connectivity. I think we were shocked even here in Seattle to learn of neighborhoods with very poor connectivity relatively close to the university environment where we thought perhaps everybody had great service. Uh, and uh, those are often uh, found in inequitable distributions in society too. So this tension, I think, between equitable, equitably delivering our entire university, not just courses, uh, but also doing it, a way, doing it in a way that we understand that new inequities could be created and we have to pay attention to what's happening in those spaces. So, so to me, that's the breadth of when we talk about horizontal scale uh, across our universities. And I do hope that we can continue to move this forward without some of the traditional long time frames that it has taken us in the past. Beautiful. Thank you, Ravi. And there, there is a lot to unpack there, and we're going to come back for a second round comments. Karen, how are you doing? Good. You helped distill the book into an epilogue. You were one of, one of the authors of the epilogue 
um, what were some of the striking outcomes that you saw authors coalesced around? I mean, this was a global book, um, chapters from the US as well as the Netherlands and India. What do these global stories tell? So just as uh, the three folks who preceded me, who I have such great respect for, described, you know, each of, of the folks writing the chapters and myself included were involved in our institutions in, uh, in as Rovi said, sort of experimentation, or perhaps it was MJ who said experimentation with the use of technology to distribute learning, to create greater access for people. And many of us, especially your team, Yakut, was, was developing huge vertical capacities and learning a great deal from all of the work we were doing. So the people who wrote these chapters had um, deep and broad experience in the use of technology to create access for students and uh, in the use of the technologies and the support mechanisms to enable faculty to deliver education really effectively in an online platform. When the demand for horizontal scaling hit, whoosh, you know, right across all of our campuses. I saw it personally on my campus. All of you saw it. I'm sure that all of our listeners saw it, whether they're sitting in a campus environment, a school environment, or indeed a corporate environment. Suddenly we all needed to be involved in essentially online education, online engagement. And the, the big takeaway I think from the book was that the areas that had this prior experience had the capacity to coach, deliver, and really move things forward, uh, kind of save the day for many institutions. Otherwise there would have been a sort of flat-footed, close the doors response when people couldn't be in residence anymore. And, and I think that that raised the bar and preceding speakers have named this for many other stakeholders, leaders on our campuses, uh, parents in, in K-12 schools, or in higher education spaces, and all sorts of other people who realize the kinds of things that we've been identifying, that you have to have the right kind of space, you have to have bandwidth, you have to have the right kind of technology. None of these things are inexpensive. And I mean, when we think about everything transitioning to the cell phone usage, the new iPhone is not an inexpensive item. And so the expectation that our students could easily just jump into that space uh, we discovered was an inappropriate one, even though we thought everybody had these kinds of services. So the big takeaway, I think, is this eye-opening awareness of the things prior speakers have named, the inequities, the accessibility issues, the capacity for technology to deliver, but it's just the medium. It's not the design. The reality that the design and the people doing the instruction we're gonna to need to really rethink the way they did their work. Um, it, it was stunning, it was challenging, everybody did it. And so we have this new moment of achievement in the mix of, and I'm gonna sort of leave this for you to take us to a next stage, in the mix of this constant conversation lately, at least, of Zoom exhaustion. And I can sort of see everybody in the audience nodding and yawning with regard to that, right? So how do we take this pivotal moment when we discovered so much, so much that was possible and also so much that needed attention and recognized capacity to deliver to so many people who can't gain access to education if we don't change the way we think about delivery? And how do we pivot into a moment of really utilizing all of that rather into the very tempting, rather than to the very tempting, um, I'm exhausted by Zoom, please take me back to my classroom. Um, you, you are so right. And we, we're probably going to talk about that Zoom exha exhaustion piece as well, because um, I feel like you know, our hopes, plans, and ambitions for innovations fueled by COVID-19 we had to sort of postpone them because this semester, at least you know, in a lot of the institutions, it's residential, 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 right? So we all thought, you know, post pandemic, there are going to be all these good things and that um, we're just holding back because for, you know, different reasons, residential at all costs approach is, you know, maybe political, you know, parent, parental pressures, you know, we're there. But then um, are we going to have the energy when we get there? To, to innovate and continue um, you know, discovering new things and do the design as it needs to be done. 
So one of the outcomes of our work in this uh, book um, pointed to the compelling necessity to develop a stable and dependable ecosystem of learning technologies, which is like squarely in the wheelhouse of this conference, right? Enabling the talent resources and expertise to guide faculty and create meaningful learning and learner engagement in addition to the modality engagement, right? And pursue new opportunities for effective, accessible and affordable higher education. Now that was over a year ago. Has anything changed? And you, you alluded to some of this, and this is our opportunity to dive deeper into some of the comments you made. Um, have your institutions moved in the direction that you expected or hoped that they would? Um, how about students? Um, have you been able to scale horizontally? Well, we did this as a response and an emergency response. I mean, have you done anything to sort of make it ma mainstream like NJ um, uh, alluded to at the beginning? Uh, so this is, this is an opportunity for us to you know, have an interactive conversation. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. And Mark, um, I'm hoping that you're going to give us an indication if there are any questions that we need to pause and answer. Um, but you know, anybody jump in and let's start talking about so, Yakut, uh, it's Mary. Mary in San Diego, UCSD, and I'm sitting downtown at the most trafficked intersection of the trolley and bus lines that connect Tijuana to the UC San Diego campus, north south, and connect low income neighbors, neighborhoods in the east, eastern part of the city with the affluent downtown center city. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because we've had an overflow of enthusiasm and interest from faculty in being engaged in some way in this urban presence all around equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. So what I'm trying to say as the sociologist in the group is I think we may be beginning to see a shift in faculty attitudes about where we have to go and what we have to do in order to fulfill our education mission in this new environment with these new imperatives. And so it's, it, what I, I'm not addressing the technology commitment so much as my sense, and I'm, you know, uh, 79 years old, I've been in this business a long time, and my delight and surprise in the numbers of faculty, including in the very basic research arenas, our Center for uh, uh, Renewable uh, Materials, which works with pond scum to make surfboards and fun stuff like that. Our Qualcomm Institute, which has uh, the most advanced interactive computing technology to do remote surgery and all kinds of interesting devices to enrich public understanding of science. The School of Public Health, US Mexico Studies Center, Urban Studies, uh, Arts and Humanities, doing interdisciplinary Syrian film festivals, uh, celebrations, of music of the Americas in music series. All of these are, are gestures of commitment to as a university being more present and more relevant. Now that could just be San Diego or California, but if that faculty culture is starting to change, that's an inroad to talk about. And another way is technology. How do we reconfigure the way we deliver education using technology to be effective in these communities uh, moving forward? Mm -hmm. And if, <clears throat> if I could piggyback on that a little bit, I, I, I agree, Mary, and I, it's such positive movement in those directions um, around you know, trying to improve access going both ways. But one of the things that worries me is, and, and Roby, you were talking a little bit about some of the research that's been done about um, non-significant differences regardless of delivery mode and so forth. You know, that, those, that research, as you know, goes back to the 80s, the Clark and Cosma debate. And I, forget, I can never keep straight who said what, but one of them at one point said, 
okay, there may be no significant difference, but I sure would prefer that the ice cream get delivered by the truck with the refrigeration as compared to the flatbed, right? So there, you know, there are some differences with respect to delivery mode that are important and critical for certain things that we're trying to accomplish. And, and what's what's been starting to worry me a bit as I look across our system institutions, we have three HBCUs that do amazing work with underrepresented populations because of their ability to meet students face-to-face, -face, mentoring, advisement. Um, you know, at one of our presidents at Bowie State University, uh, Dr. Aminta Bro, characterized it as a big hug. When you come to campus, you get a big hug. We have never been good about figuring out how to replicate that secret sauce of the face-to-face -face environment online. And in fact, I suspect many of us are doing the work we're doing right now because we believe there's still a certain amount of things that really are best taught face-to-face. -face. We just haven't quite gotten there yet with the technologies. So I worry a little bit about jumping so quickly into this that we lose sight of the fact there's still a lot of work to be done around understanding how do we meet various learner populations online? How do we create that same kind of, of mentorship support services, Rovi, that you, you talked about as well in your opening remarks and make sure that we're not losing a lot of students uh, as a result of, of, of jumping so quickly into something that we're, we're just blind to the fact that there are a whole lot of people being left behind. I, I'll jump in here um, and uh, <clears throat> let me go back to something that Mary said, because this was a trend happening at the University of Washington in Seattle prior to the pandemic. Uh, our faculty really beginning to debate the importance of community engaged scholarship uh, versus more traditional forms of scholarship uh, publications and so forth, which still remain the coin of the realm and are ultimately extraordinarily important, but realizing that impact uh, has a um, as much of a marker of service for our faculty as writing, and uh, uh, we opened a small space um, on the on the light rail. And by the way, we had our, our a light rail opening just outside of our office on campus on Saturday morning. So, and Friday evening, I was there with the mayor and others as we cut the ribbon uh, and opened this new access point to the physical space of our university, which does connect into downtown and connects into some of the neighborhoods that are drastically underserved by higher education. One of those neighborhoods prior to the pandemic is the Othello neighborhood in South Seattle where 63 different languages were spoken and uh, Continuum College came together with the rest of our institution to create a 2300 foot space, very small, but very flexible. This was not a classroom delivery space, but a space where people could conduct research, uh, the, the number of things we packed into that space is absolutely amazing. Working with our nursing department, you will find a tiny sink inside of a conference room on the, on the mezzanine of this tiny space so they can do blood draws and conduct community related health research in this space. And that's bringing the university in total into the community rather than just a slice of the university, which might be our educational delivery. And I think for places like UCSD, also uh, UW, and certainly MJ, you have a system perspective across many of your campuses, but the research institutions for us at the University of Washington, 80% of our undergraduates have a meaningful research experience. That's very unusual, even at research institutions. So when we talk about scaling and scaling our whole university, it's about making sure that we don't say the online students don't get that opportunity to conduct research, only our face-to-face -face students get that opportunity to conduct research. So I hope we're in a moment where we already, we saw faculty already beginning to understand that their impact was more than their research. Their impact was also the work that they were doing in and with community. And we combine that with the capabilities, what we're learning today, what could be delivered, what could be done, uh, that we do move forward. And, and MJ, your point is well taken because we don't wanna just rush in uh, and create a pale or shallow version of what we do. I think it really is making sure we are um, connecting the dots here uh, with our, within our own system so that we actually can reach the students across the breadth of what we do and not just in one narrow uh, aspect of our, of our university. Karen? Really excellent comments. And, and I'll just jump in and sort of push us into a slightly different sphere because much of what we've been reflecting on is about the traditional age student uh, the more typical student that our campuses are so familiar with, comfortable with, the people that we give hugs to, MJ. Um, but I think we all recognize, and, and I think in many ways through the pandemic, both employees and employers recognize the dramatic need to reach people who were 
potential employees, but had been left behind perhaps by their circumstances and didn't have access to degree even beginnings. But, but what about those many people we've spoken about who started but didn't finish? And then there are the people who perhaps finished or perhaps did not and are gainfully employed, but their employment, as Mary suggested earlier, is constantly in transition and flow. And we talk about this regularly. We, we, we recognize this in, in daily life when we see the way in which just transactions and simple circumstances have changed, right? Um, and so I hope that we broaden the conversations that we are all having to address the needs of students who truly don't have access because of their life circumstances, but who need access as much as anyone else. As I listen to this, I also think about the way in which we constantly um, sort of view the delivery of education as a, a delivery obligation that we have from the, the sort of knowledge holder to the knowledge needer through the truck transportation that, that MJ referenced, but in our case now through these kinds of vehicles that are far more uh, effective than they were even five years ago, never mind it back in the in the 90s and such when we were dabbling around with this newer technology that had been popped up on our screens in, in the 80s. And so I wonder about this uh, a, a sort of connectivity between this new learner population the access that the pipeline of technology creates and the way in which we've traditionally thought about delivery from beginning to end, from the knower to the neater. And what if it went back and forth in both directions? And what if that were something that were to help us create the kind of community that we know is so important? A learner needs to know that they're valued. They need to be a part of a community whether they're in a classroom, on a residential campus, or by themselves in a home space where they have many other obligations to take care of during the day, but need to be a member of a community of learners with the same kinds of aspirations and goals that they have, but in many ways with, with the need to understand what they themselves as a student can share that would advance the knowledge of others. And when we think about those learners who are more sophisticated and experienced in the ways of life and the workforce, they have a huge amount to offer to our younger, more traditional students who have no experience of that sort. And I witnessed this myself in person as the Dean of the, the then new School of Professional Studies at Brown University, when we were able to bring um, in mid-career format, master's degree learners who, um, had incredible experiences. I remember a, a person in your area, Mary, uh, in San Diego, working in, in very impoverished environments with AIDS patients, for example. And in contrast to that person, a very sophisticated surgeon in Houston. And what they were able to tell and teach each other and what they were able also to tell and teach undergraduates at Brown University who didn't have those kinds of direct experiences in life, the whole ecosystem of that sort of community, if we can think about it a little bit more. And I'll conclude by saying, the other thing I witnessed was the faculty saying, wow, I learned so much from both the individual learners, but more so from the conversations they had and from what they told me a week after learning something from me, what they told me that they learned when they tried that thing out in the workplace and they brought back reflections, which changed the way I thought about my particular knowledge and how to share it with others. So I'm, I'm advocating for this kind of community that we can develop in our ecosystem. It needs a lot more research, a lot more thought, a lot more experimentation, but I think it can make a huge difference and get us past that, that little roadblock I mentioned before, the Zoom exhaustion. There's no need for that. Let's just keep moving. I love how you all um, expanded this conversation and the university or higher education impact beyond courses, programs, credentials, and taking the, the entirety of the higher education institution to the community in a variety of ways. I just, I just love that. Um, so my question to you is going to be, and this is completely unscripted, unscripted, so I apologize for throwing this at you. But I mean, we all represent um, institutions with you know, more money, more impact. Um, so how does, 
how do how do how does a faculty member or an administrator from a regional university relate to what we're talking about in terms of expanding? Expanding access is about two things for me: scale and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like these two things should be present for for us to be able to expand impact, expand access. So um, institutions with uh, fewer resources, how does this conversation translate to, to their reality and how can they make an impact? So I'll, I'll kick things off on this one. We have several regional comprehensive institutions in the system, some uh, far flung in, out in the mountains of Western Maryland uh, and over on the Eastern shore, a lot of, uh, uh, working communities that they serve. And, um, you know, one of the, and, and we also have a fully online institution, right? So, you know, managing these dynamics within our system has, has been interesting over the years. And, and prior to COVID, I, as I know you all know, um, you know, the largest single growing population of online students were students that were taking online classes from an institution within 50 miles of their home. And I was thinking about this actually, Karen, while you were just talking that, you know, how many of those folks are older, need access to, to instruction, but they desperately also want the community piece. They wanna be able to go to the library. They wanna to engage in group work and to see their faculty members and be part of high impact practices and research opportunities, Rovi. Um, so for me, I think, where, where I would love to see particularly the regional comprehensives playing in this space is in being a lot more strategic about the ways in which the affordances of the online tools can help them better serve their current students or the current students they'd like to have. So the, the adult learners, Karen, the, the lifelong learners, the people that need to come back to them to upskill, reskill, and those that want a full four-year degree but can't do it, you know, in the 15 to finish kind of a model. You know, they've got life going on all around them, but they want that local community. They, they want to be part of that, that regional higher education experience. So, so helping our institutions, particularly the faculty, who I've seen so often say, okay, well, we'll just put a program online. You know, we'll just take all these courses and dump them over here. Instead, be more strategic about, again, what are the things that are taught well together? And can we bring even those far-flung people that, you know, need better access to campus occasionally to engage them in those, those experiences that they want to have while offloading a lot of other things into the online space and, and making sure they have access that way? Um, and who are those people? When do they need that access? Where are the pain points for them? And how do we be more strategic about the ways in which we are investing in online um, to, to better serve their needs. So I'll leave it at that and my colleagues here jump no, in this on is, This is really good. We have probably two more minutes. Uh, we do want to continue this conversation, folks. And um, somebody told me once that a good webinar is when people leave it wanting to have more of it. So I think from that perspective, we still have a lot to talk about, but we're running out of time. Uh, I'm going to ask Mark to put my email in the chat. Mark, if you don't mind. Uh, if you want to continue this conversation, maybe in, a, in the next version of this book, um, collaborating with the authors here, please, please reach out to me and we will, we will love to have that conversation. But I'm going to, uh, well, first of all, thank you all, all of you for being a part of this conversation. And every time I, I'm in a meeting with you, I just feel so smart. So, I mean, I leave having learned stuff. So I, I really appreciate that. But I will just... Uh, leave the last minute for someone to jump in and make some closing comments instead of me. So anybody? Come on, I didn't want Please. to have the last word there. I didn't know we were uh, so close to time. Go, Roby. I like, I like Karen, so she did the epilogue, so she's piping. Oh my goodness, right on the spot. I, I think I'm just gonna add to all of that, that we talk so much about our roles and our institution's roles and the technology and the faculty, et cetera. And I think that if we pause and we expand into this thing that you could just reference and MJ as well, this sort of bigger community, how do we create community within community that isn't just a campus-based kind of thing, again, with a line of delivery from knower to, to need to knower, um, and how do, we, how do we reach out to other players, um, corporate enterprises? I mean, there are many places where people can come together and find communities around like-minded challenges and concerns and, and empathize with each other, learn together. They don't need to be 
just on a campus, nor do they need to be just online. And if we can start thinking about ways to engage those spaces, then I think we expand and advantage so many more people. And we also address issues of diversity and inclusion sort of automatically by embracing that kind of um, larger uh, enterprise community. Yep, it's about scale. All right, well, thank you. And Mark, thank you for, for facilitating this conversation for us. And everybody, please take care and be well. Bye. <laughs>